welcome to everyone. This is, I believe, the first small group session that the Center for Public Leadership has held this year, and the sort of goal of these sessions is to have an opportunity to speak to um, people who have had excellent experiences in the private and public sector, like Mr. Schwarzman, and to share uh, their insights into leadership and business and public service in general. So we're very pleased today to have such a, a fantastic guest to join us, not only today, uh, for this small session, but also later for your larger talk. I believe you're talking about transformational leadership over lunch. And uh, a number of us look forward to hearing your comments on that. Um, many of you don't need an introduction to Mr. Schwarzman, but nevertheless, uh, he is CEO and co-founder of the Blackstone Group and was involved in all phases of the group's firm's development since founding it in 1985. He approves all the capital commitments made by the firm. He manages over $32 billion in alternative assets since 1987. He began his career at Lehman Brothers, where he quickly uh, moved up the ladder and served as chairman of the firm's Merger and Acquisitions Committee in the early 80s. In addition to his work with the Blackstone Group, he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, chairman of the board of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. He's also on the board of the New York Public Library, the New York City Ballet, Harvard Business School Visiting Committee, J.P. Morgan Chase National Advisory Board, among others. He has all the right degrees, unfortunately from all the wrong places, a BA from Yale and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, we're very happy to have him here at the Kennedy School, and he has served as an adjunct professor at the Yale School of Management. So we're very pleased to have you today. Before we hop right into the question and answers, since that's sort of uh, the format of these sessions, do you have anything that you want to say uh, briefly as an introduction? Yeah, I'm just absolutely exhausted from listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's really a lot of stuff. Uh, we sit back and uh, listen. I, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable in a Q and A thing. Uh, and um, uh, you know, why don't, why don't we start out a little bit uh, that way? I mean, this is this is about leadership, and, and you know, for those of us in charge of things, and I've sort of been in charge of stuff my whole life. You know, from from being. Um, you know, like a little kid, I don't know why I wanted to be the head of student council, but it seemed like it would be fun uh, because you could do stuff. I always like doing things, and, and the easiest way to do things is to be in charge of them uh, because that way you can set the agenda for what's going on, and, and life's a little bit, you know, the realm of the possible. And uh, I, I enjoy, among other things, um, sort of looking at a situation and saying, how can we make this better? What, what can we do with it? Uh, what's the maximum potential that we can get out of this? Uh, and, and, you know, that involves sort of assessing what the organization's mission is. And sort of looking at your people, you know, seeing, you know, what they like to do and what their capabilities are. You know, seeing what's missing that you might have to, you know, supplement them. And then coming up with a vision uh, for things. Um, what, what, what I've found uh, in, in life is that the hardest thing to do isn't to get things done. Uh, you, you can get things done with enormous energy. It's really helpful to not sleep. Uh, it's helpful to be desperate uh, to uh, achieve your uh, objectives. Uh, but the most important thing, and where you really have to spend a lot of time working on, is what's the vision of what you're trying to achieve? Is it unique? Does it appeal uh, to, to, to people? Who's going to buy into that? Uh, and if you spend a lot of time, a lot of time, making sure that's right, um, people get confused with the success that is the actual doing of the things. When they see things actually happening, I, I actually get relatively um, uh, much less interested in the actual things that are happening than, than sort of inventing the fact that they're going to happen. Uh, and then when people play their parts out in that drama, you know, that, that's what is sort of viewed in the conventional world as reality. Uh, I, at that point, am not so interested in it. I'm, I'm off to my next thing. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's the technical aspect, I guess, you know, this the leadership right, of, of how do you get people to buy in. I, I look at that as sort of a technique uh, it's, that, that is necessary uh, to, to get to, to an end point. 
but you have to have a vision that you're, you know, the fact that you're selling, marketing, convincing, use whatever word you want. We got an extra seat here, so uh, you, can, you can join. You get the advantage of, uh, of, of being late, so, so you get my first question to you, right? Uh, so it's, a, it's the penalty for lateness. Uh, that, uh, so, 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 so that, to me, is, is something that I've always spent an enormous amount of time. And, and once you have the right vision, the right mission statement, you can do like really amazing things if, you, if, if, you, if you're good at, if you're highly persuasive, then all of a sudden, you know, it really works. But imagine just selling some tired old message. I mean, that's really tiresome for people listening to it. So, so you have to come up with something that excites people, solves a problem, does something that's really uh, important. Uh, and, and then, you know, once you do that, it's it's really much easier to do the the other uh, other pieces. So you have to almost reinvent whatever you get involved with, and and, and give people something to be shooting uh, for. That is a it, 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 it's a it's a vision typically that extends the realm of the possible, uh, and and you have to believe it because if you don't believe it, nobody's going to believe it. Right, uh, and you, you, the only reason you believe it isn't because you're an ideologue. It's, it's because it's a rational vision. You've thought it through. You know that can be done. It just hasn't been done before. Okay, that's all right. Uh, who cares? It's it's the fact that it can be, uh, and and you know. But you got to be right because you're really selling a lot of people that concept. And if you're wrong, it'll all collapse because nobody buys in. So uh, anyhow, that's. That's just sort of some opening BS, uh, and uh, you know, so you asked me to open. There it is. It's open. I appreciate that. I think that's a sort of a great setup for our first sort of opening question in these sessions. We discuss the importance of uh, having a vision and implementing it, and if you're successful, then you can move on to the next step. But if it's perhaps not such a well thought out vision, then you can have it totally collapse on you. And so I was wondering if you would share with us um, two examples. One where you successfully sort of implemented a vision and things went very well and one perhaps maybe uh, where the vision didn't work out as well as you wanted and why you think uh, things did not work out as you had hoped. Geez, there's so many good ones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know so, so I'll do them real fast, okay? Because easy ones. I you know, remember when I was in high school, uh, it's closer to your age than my age is to you now, uh, that, you know, I wanted to have some fun and get my high school galvanized, so I decided it would be really great to have like a famous rock and roll star uh, come. And uh, uh, so I set about trying to figure out, okay, how could I pay for this uh, thing? And uh, who could we get? And uh, what kind of format? And then I started just like making phone calls. Uh, and because uh, I wanted, I had a vision that I wanted everybody in the high school coming to one thing to unify the place, get everybody excited so then we could like hang other stuff, you know, on it once you got everybody mobilized. Uh, and so I got little Anthony and the Imperials who you won't even remember. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was some group and, you know, I, people suggested other people. But actually <laughs> wouldn't have gotten everybody to fill in the seats. And I like the one that, you know, They'd fill the seats. That's all I knew. People would get excited about it. And so we brought them all in, and that started, you know, my little student government thing. And people said, oh, boy, that's really hot. You know, let's get more involved with student government, whatever it was. And, you know, that's just like a little one. But, I, of course, I still remember it because I happened to be at my high school because I, I just gave them the football stadium. Uh, uh, and uh, so I was there, and there was, you know, like my name up on something, and one they walked me into the gym, and I said, geez, I remember that gym. We did a little Anthony and the Imperials uh, there. Uh, so, you know, that's like a, you know, sort of a, a little thing. Uh, I mean, starting a firm, jeez, uh, that's like a big deal. Sure. Particularly if it's your life, uh, as opposed to just a rock concert. Uh, and, you know, you have a vision of what you wanted to do. Well, we had a vision, I mean, a really strong vision. We wanted to do uh, you know, sort of M&A advisory work to pay the rent. We wanted to uh, go into what's now called the private equity business. It's then called the LBO business, leverage buyout business. Uh, and then we wanted to take people from 
Wall Street firms. Wall Street was very small in the olden days, 1985. Uh, uh, I joined the firm had 550 people. Uh, it was called Lehman Brothers. And now it's got like down 20,000. So when you have 550 people, you actually know everybody by sight. You know most of them by name. When you got 15, 20,000 people, you're just working in an institution, right, for the most part, except for a few people. So um, we thought that, that people who grew up in that era of 500 people would um, not be happy as these firms grew. So the third piece of what we wanted to do as a business was to, 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 to basically have a human scale place where people would come and, and sort of go into business with them, give, her, give them our name, have uh, you know the infrastructure so they wouldn't be alone, have the support, but give them a big ownership of their company they couldn't get at the big place, and then uh, you know uh, uh, spend their careers with. Us. So, so so what we did is we 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 wrote a letter to everybody we knew uh, and said this is what we're going to do, and it's now 20 years later. We have so little imagination. We are doing just that. <laughs> we have never changed what we did. Now, I could tell you endlessly about the agony of getting it, the, the, the failures of, uh, you know, just sort of, uh, failures of expectation, your own expectation, where you think something's going to work a certain way, and it just doesn't, you know. Just starting from the first act of sending a letter out to everybody you know, and assuming you're going to be overwhelmed with responses. <laughs> uh, I mean, talk about ego. Uh, and you know, you write it all. You, know, you spend all this time, develop this great plan. Hi, everybody. It's us. We're going into business, and uh, you should be really excited because we are. And uh, here, here's our here's our number. Please call. Give us business. Uh, you know, we want to be just as successful as we were. After the first day or two, you walk in. First of all, you're walking into like this greatly diminished place. I mean, it's like, you know, you're used to like a giant place where you're an important person. You go in, it's just you and one other person. And it's like, phone, you had to hook it up yourself. You leave that aside. It doesn't ring. I mean, it has a ringing device. But uh, no one's calling. No one is calling. And you sit there. I'm sorry, this is being recorded in a way. But you say, what did I ever do here? How did I get in this movie? I put myself in this movie. What was I thinking? And you just sit there and you go, oh my God, this is just, this is so desperate. How do I get out of this? Uh, how, do, how do I make this work? How do I make this happen? And it is not easy, okay? It, it is not easy. And you know, the number of mistakes that anybody makes, I don't care who you are, um, you know, in the finance business, I used to think, well, Forget finance. I used to think that if you were smart, you could get everything correct. And I, I still believe that. But reality is that that's not true. If you make a lot of decisions, a lot, and I happen to make a lot, or people around me make them, and then if they work well, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, and if they don't work well, then it's my decision, uh, which is also how these things work. But but it's it's really it's really hard when you recognize that it's like any portfolio that gets managed. You make a lot of decisions. You buy a lot of things, right? Every one you buy, you do the analysis of, and they're all supposed to be good, or else you wouldn't buy them. Then you look at it, and and, and some things you know go up like a hundred percent, and some things go up fifty percent. Some things, most of them, sort of. You know, they're sort of like around 10%. And then you get these clunkers that just, they lose money. And you are the same person doing the analysis. And you believe in them all, or else you wouldn't have done it. And then you look at the outcomes of life. So, so things that don't work, they happen. And, 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 and sort of psychologically dealing with that, and how you plan for it, and it's a whole thing that you probably aren't as familiar with called risk management. Because well-meaning people like all of us use our brains, and then you find out you can make an incredible boo-boo. Uh, and if you concentrate all your time in it, or, you know, disproportionately, 
allocate your resources to that, and that happens to be the one statistical boo-boo, you, you, you could like wipe yourself out. And so you, know, you have to divide, this is just a little mini finance lesson, you, know, you, you have to divide uh, things. But in terms of, um, you know, sort of mistakes, I mean, my God, they're like, I, I could do mistakes for a long time. I mean, we, 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 we bought control of, um, of this, I guess it was the second largest cell phone company in Argentina uh, in the 1990s. It was good price, it was cheap. Argentina, Argentina was, was linked to the dollar. Everybody thought that was the most wonderful thing that could ever happen. The company was growing uh, uh, very well. And um, two months later, the, the country collapsed. Everybody who'd invested there basically went bankrupt. We lost every dollar. And you sort of went, what did I miss here? What did I miss? I mean, I mean that just happened to be like a money loss. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's bad. You know, it was bad. Uh, we've had some other ones. Um, you know, occasionally. We have way more successes. Uh, obviously, or else you wouldn't have me here. <laughs> but if you're asking about failures, I think much, much, much more about failures than I ever do about successful things. I can tell you every failure we've ever had, uh, uh, commercially, uh, other things. Because I believe that you learn most, you, you learn from your failures, you learn what a bozo you are. Uh, and you learn, what did I miss? And so what I also find is that most people are uncomfortable with, with looking at their failures. I don't know why that is, but it, they get like defensive about it. Uh, and every time we fail, I go, okay, what, did, what are we supposed to be learning here? What did we miss? Who missed it? Why did they miss it? Why did I miss it? Why did our system miss it? Uh, what, was it inevitable? I mean, Argentina, frankly, was one of those, it's a bad example, where so many people missed it and it was viewed as an economic miracle or momentum was supposed to be great. And I mean, all the analysis, nobody thought that was going. Uh, it, just, it just didn't. But, but there are other ones where you look back and, and, and the, the objective is always to get better uh, from, from, uh, from your failures. And that, that, that's why. In, in Japan, you know, like being an older person is like a good thing because you're supposed to have actually learned from life, uh, you know, learn, learn, learn from, from your mistakes. The successes, you know, uh, you, you, you don't learn that much from because your instincts are working right. You, you, you know the right place to go. You've done it. You'll continue doing it. Uh, but it's when, you, when reality tells you that you're really, like, You've laid an enormous egg. You just don't want to do that uh, uh, twice. Uh, and, and so, you know, we've had enormous successes on, on most of the businesses that, that we've started. It's just the business side of my life. Uh, enormous. And, and all of them are very logical, uh, I, I thought. Uh, we had only one thing that didn't work well, where we started a business with a fellow who was extremely opinionated. And he said, hey, when, when we went into business with him, he said, look, uh, I want to have complete control of what I do. You can, you can give me advice, but ultimately, I decide if, 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 if you don't like my results, you, you should fire me. I sort of thought that was a little odd, but I was a young guy, so this guy had, had some success. He had some failure. I didn't know enough to even do the right assessment because I was pretty young then. And, 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 um, and we saw in his area things going wrong and we'd sit down once a week and say you know I think we shouldn't be doing this and I could give you the exact situation but it wouldn't be as be interesting for me to talk about it because I still think about it incessantly <laughs> uh, but, but, but uh, I, and some of it weren't just opinions we, we knew things and um, and this guy would say, yeah, it's really interesting, but I don't see it that way. Uh, and um, I said, well, how can you not see it that way? I mean, it's like, it's the way it is. He said, well, no, that's just what guys like you think. Uh, you know, that's, that's when the truly bold get going, 
when all of you weenies, uh, you know, uh, decide that things don't work. I said, well, they don't work because the Federal Reserve is restricting credit to the area that you're going to be investing in. So when the Federal Reserve is telling you the game's over, they're the dealer in the house, it's over. Well, you know, that's just a short-term thing, and I, the guy just lost a bunch of money for us. And I remember one day, uh, I was, uh, it's about failure, uh, I, I, was, I was in Ritz Carlton in Naples, and it's before the age of like cell phones, and, you know, the big clunky ones, not these <laughs> little razors. And, um, and I was um, in my hotel room in between meetings, and he sort of can drag the phone out close to a balcony so I could get a little suntan and, you know, prove to my wife I actually had gone someplace, right? Uh, and so I'm out there, you know, the sun's coming down, it was a horseshoe, you know, sort of the sea. And, you know, the sun was like barely touching my balcony. So I'm out there, the phone can't reach, and, I was, and this guy's telling me how we just lost, uh, we had a good day today. And uh, um, I said, how's that? He said, well, we only lost X million dollars. <laughs> I said, well, <clears throat> why was that a good day? He said, well, I, I did some great trading, you know, and we would have lost double that. And this is after a series of other lessons. And I was sitting there and I sort of was looking up at the sky, watching myself, wasting my time talking to him, sort of, you know, <laughs> like, like that. And I, I said, you know, I don't think we had a good day. I think your definition of a good day is really wrong. A good day is when you make a lot of money, not when you lose a bunch of money. I said, we're so twisted, I think. I, th I said, I think we ought to bring this to a close. And uh, he said, well, that doesn't surprise me that you'd say that. Do you want to fire me? I said, he, I said, what's the alternative? And he said, well, I can liquidate all my positions and you know, we can start again. I said, no, I, I think firing you is a good idea. And uh, he said, by the way, you were right in everything you told me. I was wrong. I, I, I should have listened. And I said, well, we tried to be as convincing as we could be because it was fact-based stuff. And uh, he said, well, I, I don't blame you. So, so what did I learn besides the fact that I was unbelievably stupid? Uh, they have gotten us involved with this. What I learned is that, first of all, some people like march to their own drummer. They're not in touch with reality. Uh, secondly, I don't want to be a victim of any person like that. And so what I learned is that we'll never do anything where we don't maintain control. Uh, uh, and you know, we can share control, but there are certain parts, uh, times, where, where uh, in, in a situation, where we have to, I have to have that ability to say, look, I've heard enough. And, you know, it's not like I'm smart, you're dumb. It's that you just happen to be, like, off. And every once in a while, people, people are off. I mean, you see it politically, where they, 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 they end up, you know, sort of committed to an idea because of an ide ideology. And, uh, you know, there are Republicans and Democrats, if you tell one story, they think you don't like them or whatever it is. But, but fundamentally, they're committed to some ideological way of solving something that the American public just thinks is incredibly stupid. Uh, and no matter how much they think, they keep doing it, which is ultimately why parties lose. You know, huge ideological shifts where they, they, they believe that they are just absolutely got the right thing. And the public is saying, and they don't change, by the way very much. Uh, they just keep believing the same thing. That's why parties remain out of government for long periods of time. Because they keep believing the same thing. The fact that it doesn't sell uh, you know, to the country doesn't seem to bother them. I, I find it astonishing. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll keep selling the same you know, sort of non-product. Uh, and, and, you know, so it's really important to, uh, to, to, to understand when people are off but keep the, uh, it's a longer answer than you wanted. No, 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 no. Maybe no. I'm talking too much, but uh, I'm supposed to be here to talk, but <laughs> I don't want to talk too much, right? Uh, 
I just had a quick question, Steve. Yeah. As you, when you look at your leadership successes and failures over the years, yeah. and looking back on them now, yeah. do you would you say you had your gut, your initial gut instinct is right the majority of the time, and when you haven't listened to it? Yeah, I played a game when I was younger. Uh, <coughs> you know, I, I basically uh, you know, on your scale of whatever you know, analytic, rational to intuitive. Uh, I'm the intuitive person, but I do all the rational other stuff. But I, I know what the answer is. Uh, and I, I don't bias the rational stuff to get the answer. But what I, what I used to do when I was younger is um, I used to use my instinct all the time and wait once or twice a year only and, and, and use my analytic, rational part of my brain on an uncertain thing. And I always got it wrong. Um, and I finally stopped because I realized that I, I sort of knew the answer. Yeah. And even though it might not be what somebody else would, would, would do, uh, whenever I'd stray from what my instinct said, I'd pretty much get blown up. Now, now the problem for, for me with academia is academia is designed for rational people. Right, uh, and and that doesn't mean if you have an instinct that that you're not rational. Um, I, you know, I, I, I thought a lot about this, uh, uh, and and you know a, a good summa cum laude person is is you know very good at, at, at moving things along in in, in in a certain way, and uh, is often right, um, and, and certainly can figure th things out if you're. An intuitive person, you, you actually, you actually have that same mechanism, but it's buried in a little chip in your brain, and you do it like that. In other words, you run through mm -hmm. that same sequence, but sometimes it's so fast, you you don't even know it's going on. When you hear the logic of the, of the very logical people like that, you go, oh, oh yeah, that's right. That, that's sort of boring. I, I know that. That's the way. That's the way that should work, right? Of course, right? But people's minds, and this is for you know, sort of the psych school or the med school, they really come way different, uh, you know, uh, ways of, of thinking. And uh, I don't know that 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 part of exploration has, has adequately, uh, you know, sort of laid out all the different styles of thinking. You know, and when I was young, I, I just believed there was an SAT style of thinking because one of the guys in my college at Yale, I mean, you know, the opposition, uh, you know, his father invented the test. Uh, and, you know, he was a Harvard professor and it was during World War II and the, whatever it was called, uh, you know, the Princeton Educational Center because he left Harvard and went to Princeton. And, you know, he, the only mistake he made in life is he did it as a not-for-profit. Uh, every person in America has taken this wretched test, uh, you know, at, at a high school, and guy gave it away. Uh, and and you know, he was testing basically for people who thought like him. That's what I figured out, right? Definition of a smart guy was somebody who thought like him. Uh, high school graduate at Harvard, right? So th that's what we all took. Uh, you know, that kind of intelligence. There are many other kinds. Uh, of ways of thinking that, that, that people use were because only so many people sort of get 800 800 right I mean we actually have like people that have work for us I could never get hired where I am uh, just but but uh, you know it's it's it, you know there, it, there are so few in the country that it's it's obviously an odd odd thing right that's not how everybody thinks so you know I think that you have to try this stuff out if you're a younger person you have to figure out what's your dominant mode of making decisions and does it work, okay? If it works, keep playing it. Uh, hard to change it. Uh, but if it doesn't work, find another way. But, but keep playing the same card over and over again and, 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 and go to your strength in terms of style of decision making and thinking. And, and the more you do it, and always keep monitoring yourself. Don't assume that just because you're doing it your way that you know it's working every time. You have to be conscious that whenever you're making a decision, is it right, is it wrong, did you miss something, 
what do you incorporate? How do you change the way you think? Uh, and then keep grafting. So it's almost like genetic engineering. You know, you put a little you know, gene piece in there, modify your sequence, uh, and then keep playing that out. Uh, and because life's a lot about uh, improving uh, over time. It does not stop when you, you move out of these very tastefully uh, done physical settings uh, here at Harvard. Uh, learning is a lifetime, I think. And if you're running something or you're in a leadership position, you always have to have to be thinking, what can we do better? What could I do better? What are we? What am I missing? What, what, what should we be changing? It, it never stays the same. It is not a boring process life. Okay? It is not boring. It is fun. It is interesting. Uh, and you always have to be evaluating all the things going around you, going on around you, and, and doing something with that. So it's a very dynamic model of life. It's, it's not a, it's not a, here's what I do when I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. You'll, you'll find that stultifyingly boring. <laughs> yes? Uh, hi, thanks for coming in today. Um, I'm a joint degree student here at the Kennedy School and at the Business School. Uh -huh. uh, I worked in the private sector at Goldman for a few years prior to coming here. You were at Cambridge? I'm sorry? Were you at Cambridge? Uh, I was at uh, I was at Goldman in the uh, PIA group, um, oh. but uh, but I guess my question are competitions. <laughs> my question yeah, is <laughs> lurking in the woods here. Uh, my, my, Full disclosure. Right. So my my question uh, for you is, I think a lot of us struggle with this here, um, both at the school and the business school, um, in terms of thinking about you know how we map out our career, and obviously there's a lot you can't plan, but. There really isn't a roadmap, uh, I think, for people who are interested in both the public sector and the private sector. And I know that something you've done well in your career is, is being able to incorporate your interests in the public good uh, into your, you know, career in the private sector. So I was wondering if you could just offer a few words about, you know, how you think about integrating those two things, and certainly it's a personal choice, but I think it's a, it's a tough struggle for all of us. There are a lot of different ways to do that. Um, um, uh, I'll, I'll direct my answer specifically to you, leave everybody out from it, uh, on, on, and then I'll, I'll, I'll address it on, uh, on a broader basis. In uh, 1969, before any of you basically were born, uh, I was in the process <laughs> of, of, of graduating you know, from uh, school, and uh, I was interested in, in I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was like a, we, we didn't have all the sophistication of everybody now with websites and you know, sort of summer jobs at Goldman Sachs or whatever it was. And, and, and it, was, it was a lot simpler world. And, and I was interested in the public world. I, I managed to get uh, this amazing opportunity uh, for me at my age uh, then and my background, which was nothing, uh, that uh, basic suburban you know, middle class that um, you know, I, I to some school connections. I, I got an, uh, 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 invited to lunch by a guy named April Harriman, who at that point was um, he was handling the uh, Vietnam peace negotiations uh, with uh, uh, Cyrus Vance, and uh, he invited me for lunch uh, at his townhouse. And um, I, I I'd never been to a place like that. I'd never owned a suit. You know, I had to go out and buy a suit, and um, never been in a place where there were paintings. Uh, I'd never met a wealthy person, um, and uh, so um, so I was, they had me stacked in the little drawing room, uh, waiting to see him because somebody else was seen happened to be the mayor of New York. So he was walking out, about 20 years old, 21. So I go in and I sit in his living room and he had a bust of Robert Kennedy up on his uh, 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 mantel. He'd just been killed, I guess, the year before. And uh, I sat in the chair on the left. He sat in the chair on the right because uh, he was hard of hearing in his left ear. So he said, you know, would you mind sitting over there? I can't hear my other ear. 
<coughs> so uh, I sat down and he said, do you mind if we have lunch? So he said, I mind anything. <laughs> I was just like sort of controlled, overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, and uh, so um, I sat down and the little man in the white coat comes and brings you your tray with the food. So he said, well, young man, he said, I, I got your letter. Uh, I understand that, um, uh, that uh, you're interested in, in, in the public world. He said, would you mind if I asked you a question? Go for it. Uh, he said, are you independently wealthy? Mm -hmm. I said, uh, no, no, I'm not. And he said, well, that will make a great difference in your life. And if my father wasn't E. H. Harriman, the founder of the Union Pacific Railroad, you wouldn't be sitting here talking to me, uh, because I was born a very wealthy uh, person. And what I'd recommend to you is that you go out and become wealthy, and then do good, because it's really hard to do good if you don't have enough money to eat and to live and have a decent life. And now I'll tell you the story of my life. And the guy spent two and a half hours just telling me about his life, which is the most incredible experience because he was, you know, sort of, he had like a great life. I mean, as he said, he said, he said, I was a, in an office of the Union Pacific Railroad when I graduated from, uh, from college. That was like a big deal. He said, of course, my father owned it. Uh, and uh, he said, they sent me to Russia because they couldn't figure out where to get rid of me. And he said, Russia was capitalist when they sent me. And they had all kinds of 19, I think he went 1920, 21. And uh, uh, hard to imagine historically. And uh, he said that, he said all of my father's rich friends were all opening factories and doing business in, uh, in Russia. He said it was a boom period. And he said, I met all these people. You know, he said, I knew Lenin, Stalin, all these guys went around. He said, I realized that these people, they weren't like us. They were going to take everything away. They were going to nationalize us, basically, expropriate us. He said, I wrote my father a letter saying, we should sell everything. We should get out. He said, but who was I? He said, I just like girls, you know. He said, I just was having a good time. And nobody took me seriously. And he said, every one of the, my rich, father's rich friends, including my father, lost every dollar. They took everything from us. And from that, you know, then he ended up starting, he came back to the States, had um, nothing to do, uh, no qualifications except he loved skiing, he was a great playboy. Uh, and, uh, you know, so they put him on the railroad and he was going around the railroad and spent a lot of time skiing in Switzerland and he went around some bend and he told me, he said, geez, I saw this mountain. He said, it sort of looked like Switzerland. So I told him to stop the train. Uh, and uh, maybe we ought to do that. That's become Sun Valley. Uh, and he said, so we built that in the hopes that somebody else would go out there. Anyhow, the guy had this great life. And World War II happened. And, um, uh, you know, sort of, he said, geez, I was like the only guy who knew all these Russian guys. He said, Stalin. I said, I spent a bunch of time with Stalin. So, uh, uh, so he said, I, he sent me over as ambassador. Uh, and he said, so that's where I spent my World War II because I knew those guys. And um, uh, then after that, you know, he said, I knew a bunch of stuff. So he went to the State Department, then he ran for governor of New York. He was governor of New York, and, and he lost because uh, he said, actually, I'm not a good campaigner. I'm not even that likable. And uh, <laughs> uh, so he said, you know, I'm no longer governor. But now he was doing these special uh, projects for uh, President uh, uh, Kennedy and, and, and uh, uh, you know, and then uh, for Lyndon Johnson afterwards. Anyhow, so that was a. If I had more time, I'd speak more. But, but that, that was sort of his diversion of, you know, that's a, his, his life. And, you know, the reason why I was answering that for you is, is because people who are sort of financially oriented, uh, his, his, you know, advice to me, which I actually ended up following, of course, was, you know, become affluent first. And then you have the opportunity through the people you meet, your own financial resources, the whole network that gets set up to be able to do things. And, and you don't have to wait until you're there if you're a Harvard Business School model person. I'm very comfortable dealing with that because I went there and I understand that. 
you know, it's really fun. In the first X years of your career, you can almost do nothing because it's so overwhelming that your desires to succeed are relatively so desperate that, that you know, you're, you're, you block out most other things. But you surface, you know, after, you know, like 10 years, and you realize you're, you're, you're not going to go below the waves. Uh, you know, you actually know what you're doing, and in fact, after 10 years in your career, you think you know way more than you actually know. I was never smarter than I was when I was about 32 or 33 years old. I mean, never ever. I, I, you just couldn't be smarter than I was at 32 or 33. And, and uh, if you fast forward uh, another you know, 20, 25 years, you know, I, I'm not really as smart uh, as, as, as I was then, uh, that's for sure. Uh, is that your phone or my phone? Or? One sec. You, you can stop that for a second if you want to see what. So, you know, being involved in uh, for profit things and other things in your community, you know, if you're like a business model person, you, you should be doing do business stuff and, and do other stuff, whether it's political involvement, uh, whether it's not, other types of not for profit, and, and not doing that. As, as a model for doing things, just being off the air. I mean, nobody does that. I mean, you should be involved in charitable things, political things. It makes you a better person, uh, you know, not in a moral sense, but, but certainly in terms of uh, 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 each, each to his own. But, but, but you know, it's growing. Uh, you know, it's a different group of people that you meet, different things that you're doing for other people, you know, who can't help themselves as well, a different kind of commitment. And, and that's part of the, the, the fullness uh, of life. Um, and, you know, you, you should do that. Uh, it's, 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 it's rewarding. It's altogether a good thing. And, and uh, you know, if you've got the talent, uh, you should be able to use that. And there are all kinds of mechanisms, uh, certainly for business people, to get involved to help people who aren't, you know, as successful who need things done, who, uh, you know, help start things or supervise things. Or, you know, from being passive, like being on a board of something, which is pretty passive, to take a more active role. And, you know, you just have to weave it into your life. Because so that's like my business answer uh, from April Harriman to, to me of how to deal with that. In terms of people who choose not to do that, I don't have as much experience, uh, you know, starting out you know, in a, a, off, of a, off of a shaky financial base. When I started my life, it was off a totally shaky financial base. I, I, I frankly found that threatening and um, not, what I, not where I wanted to be for whatever the series of oddball reasons about me. Uh, I, I didn't want to be, you know, sort of uh, without you know, sort of financial uh, uh, strength when, when, when I you know, got older, when I didn't want to. That's one of those non-analytic things. It's like the emotional. What do you want? You know, when you get older, what do you want to feel like when you're doing things? How do you feel secure? How do you, you know, all those things? They're very, very personal. Those things. Uh, so it's 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 a harder road if you're if you're just doing public stuff and and you don't have a, a good financial backing. I think I think it's much more challenging, much much more at, at personal risk. Uh, much more, uh, you know, uh, much more difficult, uh, uh, and, and so I have, I have a lot of respect and sympathy uh, for that. But it wasn't the path, certainly that I, I, I chose. Uh, we have about ten more minutes left, so if we can just keep the questions a little short and try and go through a few more, starting with Parag. Um Again, thank you for coming. I actually had a question relevant, not to disregard the advice you just gave, but. I'm trying to build a social enterprise right now, and right. I, mean, I think what experience is extremely relevant is you know you're managing Lehman at the age of 31. What advice would you give to us um, for those of us who are young who would like to manage and you know have credibility within the uh, you know within the world as an entrepreneur that that is starting out at an early age? I mean, what what did you do to build your credibility um, and you know not have people question that? Jeez. Um, being an entrepreneur is really, really hard. It is hard uh, and because ultimately you're abandoned. It's really just you mm -hmm. at the end. Forget who starts. When it starts not working, it's just you. Uh, and so what, what you need, um, 
to, if you want to be in that mode. Uh, um, and, and, and most people only do entrepreneurial things, truly entrepreneurial, once. Because it's so horrible that you tend not to do it twice. When I say entrepreneurial, I mean you're completely naked, okay? You have almost no resources. You're, you're trying to get a phone. You're trying to get something happening. The world is conspiring against you. Even you know, it may start out, you know, differently. That very soon, all of a sudden, it's, it's just you trying to make things happen. The first thing I would say is that you need enormous emotional uh, stability mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, and you need resources you never thought you had. Because when you're looking at failure, if you're at Harvard, by definition, you've been successful doing something someplace. Maybe not as much as people think, but 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 you got to be reasonably successful to be here, right? Uh, and, and so you're not used to a life of failure, uh, and 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 and, and, and a, uh, a diet of failure, which is what being an entrepreneur mostly is, in the early stages, is very difficult to cope with. It is really hard because you start going, but this isn't me. Then you say, no, no, this is me. I'm failing. Uh, and, and, uh, and I designed this myself, and I'm like drowning here. Uh, and you know, can somebody please throw me, you know, like one of those tanks, uh, you know, so I could be like Mike Nelson and Sea Hunt, you know, sharing your breathing device, you know, as somebody's bringing you up uh, from the bottom of the of the ocean. Uh, and and you have to be really a strong person. You're a man, you're a woman, it doesn't matter. There's an emotional toughness that you have to have within yourself. Uh, sometimes you don't know you have it, but if you don't have it, you'll snap. Okay, you, you'll be finished. Your organization will be finished, uh, and you have to be a great scrapper. You have to like go here, go there, find anything, try anything. Uh, and if you don't have that kind of basic temperament, just being a nice orderly, well-meaning person. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to cast aspersions of whatever the mission is of, of, uh, of, of the leadership institute, or whatever. If you don't have the attributes I'm talking about, you should not put yourself in that kind of situation. You, you could be a follower. You could be a support person, but don't be the primary person that everybody's looking to to sort of fix it and make it right because you'll crack. And then there you know, are replications, repercussions from that. Mm -hmm. uh, reputationally, uh, your own self-confidence, sometimes your health, uh, although young people, it doesn't tend to bother them too much, pretty resilient. Uh, but you've got to be really careful when you, when you start, start diving into that pool. So you got to make sure there's water there, okay? And don't waste your time diving if you know you have no skills, right? It's like being in the Olympics; you can't even do a jackknife. Uh, I mean, how silly! Why would you do it? So you got to really know yourself uh, before you put yourself uh, at that kind of risk. It's real risky. So I'm not being an encouraging an entrepreneurial person. I mean, I've done it; I've been very successful, but the cost is very high. Another question. <coughs> Did you have a question, Lori? No. Oh, okay. Um, go ahead. Kirk. Yes. Thanks for coming in. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. And if you could go back to how you were talking about leadership earlier, mm -hmm. and it sounds as though the two biggest components that you would highlight, and correct me if this is wrong, are creating a vision, mm -hmm. and that vision being the right vision. Right. And the key, of course, is that it's right. Right. And then on the other hand, betting on the right people. So you talked a little bit about intuition and just sort of having the right answer based on your experiences, based on how your mind works. But what would you say um, more broadly beyond that uh, with regard to preparing to be able to come up with the right answer in mo the right answer most of the time because ultimately that's success, right, in leadership, being right most of the time, it sounds like, from what you're discussing earlier. I don't know how to answer that. Um, you, you want to stay in a field where you're comfortable, where you, you sort of know what's going on. I don't think it's easy to do this just like across the board. 
um, at a certain point in a leadership position, there, there are certain things that are repetitive. Um, you know, sort of coming up with something that's good for that organization, having that, testing it on some people. As you get older, you don't have to test it so much. You sort of intuitively know if you're that kind of person. And then putting that out there and driving everybody to achieve that mission, whether it's a political campaign and you know, the, the person is the product of whatever that person is espousing becomes, you know, part of that product package, right? Uh, or it's or it's a business, or it's starting, you know, like a charity, where you want to take it in, in uh, other directions, where you want to make change, just sort of generally. Uh, it's sort of, a, for me, it's always the same thing, you know. It, 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 it's, it's finding something that, that galvanizes and grabs people, and then putting the people in place and getting everybody excited, and then repeating that message over over and over and over again. You just keep um, jamming that message on everybody, and then eventually that's called institutionalizing things, right? And all that means is that all of a sudden everybody knows what you stand for, whether it's your organization, if you're you know, sort of a political person, what you stand for, whether it's a company, uh, whether it's people working for you at the company, here's what you stand for. We stand for high integrity. You know, we have a zero defect culture at our firm. I believe that. I don't believe we should make any kind of mistake other than, you know, occasional judgment error. Because that's statistical. You can't get those right. But I never want to see a piece of paper that ever has anything other than perfect. Biggest, biggest change I had from academia to the real world. A B plus didn't work. An A minus didn't work. Only one grade. Hey, every piece of work, not like, hey, I got like four A's and two B's or two B pluses. I did great. Okay? That is not an acceptable standard. Okay? In the real world. My real world. And, and, and so I've helped, for our sins, create all these other people who bought into that. Right? And when you create all those people, then everyone they touch knows that's how we do things. But it's so, so, so there's a repetitiveness to the mission where you, you have to keep telling people all the time. So I've never had a problem with ethics or anything like that. I mean, that is the number one thing that I do. Every employee that we get, I give them a whole ethics thing. You can see I can be a little talky, but, but, but you know, I, I don't screw around with this stuff. I mean, you know, I, I am really tough on that stuff because I had a guy sitting next to me who, when I was a young guy. He was stealing my deals and giving them to a guy named Ivan Boski and they all went to jail. This is like, can you imagine, you know, you're in this seminar together. Let's make pretend you always take the same seats. It's a real seminar. It's not just some guests like me. And you do that not just every week, but you got like five classes a week this little group and you've been stealing something from him and you went to jail and you were conspiring with this person but this age group you think that's searing that is like and front page of every newspaper in the country person sitting right next to you so once you have that life's a funny thing okay message in terms of institutional <laughs> development yeah. ethics you know, honesty, transparency, all these kind of things. You don't need Mr. You know, Senator Sarbanes and, and, and Representative Oxley to tell you what the hell to do, right? And every person in our place never had a problem because everyone who comes in, I tell them, I'll help put them into jail if they ever hurt our business. And the first time I did this, my partner said, Steve, you're just such a harsh guy. You know, <laughs> we, just, we just hired these people and you've alienated them. Uh, you know, this is like a terrible thing for you to do. I said, no, no, no. In the long term, this is a good thing. I am protecting them, okay, from whatever frailties they may have. This isn't about being harsh. This is about a message, a culture, 
that non-negotiable. And they're going to get it, and they're going to behave that way. Okay? Because otherwise, horrific things could happen to them. You know, for our, our business as well, but for them. So, so part of, you know, creating leadership is you got to know what you care about. And when you really care about it, everybody's going to know. And if they don't buy into it, you fire them. You get rid of them. Because they'll undermine your, 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 your culture. And, and these culture things come out of like, we're all like adaptive. Mm -hmm. And you learn certain things. And if you believe in something that's really strong, don't be shy. And don't be inarticulate. Okay. If you believe something that's core, put it right out there, make people buy in. And if they really think you're wrong, you're working with the wrong people. <clears throat> Anyhow, you've been very nice to put up with me for uh, an hour and actually one hour, which is exactly what this was budgeted for. Mm -hmm. So I wish you all uh, really well. I think you're doing uh, a good thing you know, with your lives. Uh, you know, life can be a lot of fun. A lot of fun, but there are a lot of a lot of heartaches sometimes. You know, it's never straight up for anybody. Everybody takes hits, and sometimes you take big hits. Whether they're things in your personal life, or whether they're things in your professional life, and 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 part of the art of having a really good life is being able to get through those periods. Know that you're in one, and and make sure you have the resiliency. To not let it overwhelm you. Okay, just you have to just say, uh oh, this is like a bad one. It's a bad patch, it's a bad deal, it's a bad, you know, sort of thing. We lost our funding. Oh my god, you know, there you will have an infinite number of bad things happen to you. Uh, and and it happens to everyone. It's no fault of yours. Okay, in that sense. Maybe that one is your fault, but but you'll get a percentage of them because Life is not expected to just work completely well, except by you, because you're, you're doing something. It should work well, right? You're well-intentioned, you're honorable, you want to do something, it should just happen. It doesn't always work like that. Uh, and, and you have to have, uh, you know, depending upon where you go, in a place like New York, which is, which is a reasonably tough place, that, that one thing I used to say when I was younger is, 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 is that, you know, uh, that everybody's happy if someone they know well is failing uh, because there's envy uh, in the world and, and no matter what business you're in if you're in the not-for-profit world and you're doing absolutely great then you're doing greater than somebody else if you're in the political world if mm -hmm. your team's winning the other people hate you and you know just even if you're doing good things they don't care uh, you know in the business world although frankly in most cases everybody can win unless you're just head-to-head -head with one person, but if you're both selling great products, it'll expand. That's not how people think. So, so always be alert to sort of, you know, sort of people doing things that that could hurt you um, and, and lead to your defeat just for reasons of of envy, which is like a weird thing. I, I never imagined uh, actually when I was younger that that was a, a factor in life because uh, uh, I'm not that way, uh, but. Most people actually are. So don't always assume, you know, sort of lovely behavior <laughs> uh, by, by others. Uh, just because you're well-intentioned and are, are on the right track. Don't, don't assume everyone's there to help you, even if, I know this is cynical, I mean, I'm not trying to be a cynic. Even, even if they sort of say they are sometimes, if it's working too well, they get a little less happy sometimes, so it's you know it's 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 a it's a very complex and textured world that you will eventually go into, uh, but it's fun. At, at the end of the day, uh, you have to like throw yourself into it and enjoy it. So it's more than me than you need. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming. Speaking with us. Also. Uh